there's a tendency because it's a similar tendency in all uh, in all the arts and humanities, maybe a little bit in science too, except the more experimental the science is, the more of a corrective there is on swinging to extremes. But the, what I have in mind is that when a school goes out of fashion, it's as if it had no insights at all. And the result of that is that errors that that school very clearly pointed out and explained why there are errors, then get repeated because you, you don't read those people anymore, so you also don't read what was right. So, uh, and, and, and examples are, uh, I think, extremely common. I think the, um, dealt with the rationalist uh, throughout many insights of the empiricists, uh, but also the Kant, uh, I mean, it, it's interesting, uh, in 19, let me go back to my teacher, Hans Reichenbach. My favorite book of Reichenbach's is a book he wrote in 1920, published in 1921, called Relativity Theory and A Priori Knowledge. And people call that, sometimes people say, well, he was a Kantian book, or still a neo-Kantian. Well, he wasn't a neo-Kantian in the technical sense. But well, it's clear that at that stage, he was, saw that there were insights in Kant that one needed to preserve. And I think those are ones he forgot later in his writings later writings on relativity theory, especially in the, the uh, rise of scientific philosophy. But he saw the, the problem, the question of uh, that book, Relativity Theory and Apriori Knowledge, is just the question that uh, Thomas Kuhn claimed the, pro the positivist, the logical empiricist, never saw. <laughs> Namely, how are scientific revolutions possible? Reichenbach doesn't use the term scientific revolution, but he has a distinction between framework principles in science and ordinary empirical statements. I had to rediscover that for myself, or myself many years later, because the Reichenbach I studied with was teaching the rise of scientific philosophy, and that's totally disappeared. You know. But at that then so many years later, when I went back and read the 1921 book, I said, oh my God, you know, here he sees you can't, the, that every observation report in the age of Newtonian physics was couched in the vocabulary of Newtonian physics. So the question is, when the observations themselves are loaded with a theory, with a framework, how can that framework be rationally revised? Unlike Kuhn, Reichenbach concluded that it could be and gave a very interesting answer. He answered, yes, relativity theory and Newtonian physics have different framework principles, but they agree on certain things. For example, they agree in their description of what the telescope does. So you can, there isn't, there is a class of observations that they can both agree are relevant to certain questions. Like, do these, is this line straight or not straight? Does the, do these lines meet or not meet? And that's what you need to make possible a rational test of a proposed new framework. It's a brilliant answer, which Kuhn does not consider. But the important thing about it is he sees the need for this notion. In a paper he wrote in 1922, in which he praises Kassirer as the only German philosopher, other than himself presumably, who really understands relativity theory, he says we need, but he doesn't agree with Kassirer that we need to preserve some synthetic a priori, he says we need a revisable synthetic a priori. But later on, but then Carnap didn't like that, I mean, uh, Michael Friedman, who has noticed this too and written about it and investigated it, tells me it's really the influence of Carnap that pushed Reichenbach to a more positivist position to the forgetting. So, there, so then the, Carnap really wanted to throw out the bathwater and not only, <laughs> throw out the baby, not only the bathwater, and eventually succeeded in getting Reichenbach to throw out the baby, the baby being here. That, that we can't, that not all physical statements follow on a, are on a par. Some of them constitute the very lenses through which you see physical phenomena. And that's a Kantian idea. I mean, Kant put it in the structure of the mind. After the linguistic turn, we say certain things in the very structure of the language at a given time are like lenses through which you see the phenomena. They're partly constitutive of the phenomena. So, and I think in almost every area of philosophy, you can see how when a Movement goes out of fashion. Now we have a rediscovery of ins by Chris Korsgaard, Barbara Herman, and others, all students of John Rawls, of insights in Kant's ethics. 
which for a long time was just dismissed in a half a page. I'm still struggling for a name for this. I used to call these principles, uh, you know, uh, a priori relative to a body of knowledge or contextually a priori, but a relative to a body of knowledge. I don't like that because they can be false. They are false, so how can you call something a priori, <laughs> which turns out to be false? But there are, I think, things which are quasi, I've fallen on quasi -ness. There are statements which are quasi-necessary at a given time relative to the body of knowledge at that time. And that's the, that, I think, is the insight that in the, in the limited area of physics, Reichenbach had in the 1921 book. It's an insight, we, it's really, it means that when, as, as he did then, when it attempts to ask, was Kant onto something? Maybe he misdescribed it, but has he noticed something here that we should be paying attention to rather than, you know, Kant is obsolete.